I'm Tom McBride. I've been at Beloit for over 40 years and um, will be retiring in about uh, three weeks. Uh, I want to welcome all of you who are here in person today, as well as the millions who are watching in online. Uh, for those uh, alums, for example, who, in, who are in uh, Azerbaijan, I know it's three in the morning there, and I really appreciate your getting up and setting the alarm so you can uh, hear me. Uh, as I said, uh, I am leaving Beloit after 40 years, and I certainly take some pride in the role that I played at Beloit, but I take even greater pride in Beloit itself, which uh, remains immensely successful based on a very simple formula, which is that world-class experts and devoted teachers give intense help to students from all stations of life who wish to learn. It's a very simple formula. Uh, but it is a very, very hard one to maintain, and at a time when both the quality of education in the United States and the access to higher education in the United States are both decreasing, Beloit remains a heroic exception. My title is The Lost Art of Classroom Wisdom, and I will tell you right away what my thesis is. My thesis is that professors are purveyors of wisdom, not because they are wise or even because they have knowledge, but because they can apply knowledge. Now, this sounds like a rather bland and anodyne thesis, I know. Nuances uh, are in the details. The devil is in the nuances, and so let us get to the devil. If you visit a college class, you'll discover an orderly process. Professors have a good idea of what they want to teach, and even if they don't lecture, they know how they want to steer the discussion of whatever topic is on the agenda, whether it be the economic results of the French and Indian War or the aesthetic theories of Aristotle. With so much direction and coherence, you might never know that theories about what to teach and how are quite contentious. Outside the classroom, there is a lively debate about this issue sometimes out in the open, but generally tacit, sometimes with professors even sniping at each other behind one another's backs. This sometimes even happens at Beloit. Now, it would be better if these discussions were more out in the open, but that would, of course, cause hurt feelings. There's a lot of disagreement about the role of the professor, who is told that she should be, for example, a sage on a stage, for lecturing is surely the most efficient way to impart knowledge, or that instead she should be a guide on the side, for surely students learn more if they figure it out for themselves in collaboration with others. And then there's the question of what to teach. Recently I had a discussion with a colleague about this and told him that I wanted to make students, quote, excited about the material. My colleague said that he tried to get students to be deflated and angered by the material because so much of it is prejudiced and wrong. I replied that I could not tell my students to screw the material because I taught great writers after all. My colleague in the social sciences said that in his view, much of the analysis students were asked to read was pathetically and dangerously erroneous and he intended to have students read this analysis so that he could point out its deficiencies. Behind this little discussion is a much bigger one which goes on all the time. Should we be trying to infect students with great ideas or should we be trying to turn them into skeptics and even activists against ignorance and injustice? Should we teach for the material or against it? And then there is the information revolution. Recently, Ron Neef and I addressed a group of allergists and immunologists for the Mindsetless Project. This group was struggling to figure out how to balance a common curriculum in medical schools with the constant need to update it with new information. There is no limit to how much information we can add to what is now called the infosphere. It may double at least every year. For a small liberal arts college like Beloit, the problem may be whether or not professors devoted, first of all, to teaching have time to keep up with their fields. Well, I'm not here to settle all these disputes. In fact, I'm here to complicate them. Because I want to argue that these disagreements are leaving out one of the most vital things that a classroom professor can offer, and that is 
wisdom. And I'll start with a family story. My old Houston uncle, Gaston Mickey, used to tell me when I was a kid that he had attended the best university of them all, the School of Hard Knocks. A bluff, swaggering, mustachioed man, Uncle Gaston believed that experience had been the best teacher of them all, and that experience plus a knowledge of steel prices, he was a minor steel company executive, were all he needed to get through life. A character in the Indian novel Shantaram says that, and I quote, wisdom is just cleverness with the guts kicked out. By the way, I want to thank my former student, Artie Chala, class of 2009, for introducing me to this wonderful novel, Shantaram, from which I got this quotation, wisdom is just cleverness with the guts kicked out. This is, of course, a conventional idea that the only way to gain wisdom is through the hard knocks of experience, and that we often arrive at wisdom too late after our guts are kicked out. Perhaps Uncle Gaston might have realized this, that if he'd gotten wisdom earlier, before he'd made so many mistakes, he might have been a major steel executive rather than a comparatively minor one. My old professor Elizabeth Githens, still going strong at 95, always says that we get old too soon and smart too late. Ernest Hemingway, whose macho terseness is far removed from Professor Githens' southern charm, has written that life's lessons are simple, but they take a lifetime to learn. So the votes are in, and they seem to be unanimous. Wisdom comes from experience, and experience comes from a long life in which you have to get beaten about the head and shoulders. At Beloit, we have something called LAPSI, the Liberal Arts and Practice Center, where we try to give students some practical experience in addition to classroom learning. We send them out on internships, where they get to apply what they have learned. Is an internship only a structured pseudo-experience? Do students really have to graduate and get into the real world before they gain true wisdom? The Beloit College mission statement says nothing about wisdom, but we do claim to be imparting knowledge. Is there no link between knowledge and wisdom? Will we be foolish to claim that we teach wisdom at Beloit, or even impart it, if wisdom can only be gained by experience? Should we not be careful if we say, and I quote, we are charging you 40 grand a year to suggest some wisdom lessons to you, but it's going to cost you a lot more than that to gain authentic wisdom, which can only come from the difficult straits of long experience after you graduate. These are tough questions, but I will try to answer them. I'm here to say, first of all, that the connection between knowledge and wisdom is strong. And probably it is so strong that we can't deny it. Wisdom is defined as a quality of knowledge in the current LAPSI director, Charles Westerberg, likes to define wisdom as the capacity to apply knowledge in calm and dispassionate ways. Knowledge, it is said, leads to good judgment. It involves sound conclusions based on extensive learning about complex facts. But maybe, on the other hand, this is not really wisdom. Maybe this is only expertise. For instance, if someone studies art history at Beloit and then goes on to become an expert in spotting fake Rembrandts, we might say that she is wise to phony paintings. But is that wisdom or expertise? On the other hand, she doesn't just study the art history and then learn to weed out the spurious Rembrandts. It takes a lifetime of experience to do that well. It takes years to be able to do it quickly and accurately a subject that Malcolm Gladwell covers famously in his best-selling book, Blink. So even wisdom in the sense of expertise takes a lot of experience. Again, if wisdom requires long experience, then we can't possibly teach wisdom here at Beloit, can we? I mean, we only have four years in which to do so. Meanwhile, our students are generally housed and fed in some security and comfort, a summer job or an internship or perhaps a trip overseas is about the only hard experience they are likely to get. But as President Kennedy used to say, I think we can do better. I believe we can impart wisdom in the classroom. And I want to tell you why I think that. 
Well, for one thing, students often believe that some of their professors are actually wise. Now, they may be quite wrong about that. But because we are older than they, and because we know more than they, and because we often measure them as crypto parents, they will often look to us for wisdom. So when we think about teaching wisdom at Beloit, we have a built-in dynamic, the professor as parental figure. This, by the way, should make us professors tremble with some fear and humility. For some students, more may be riding on our words than we realize. And then there's another thing. What do students remember? Well, I went through four years of undergraduate school and five years of graduate school. What I most remember by far are words of wisdom from my professors, such as the aforementioned nonagenarian Elizabeth Giffins, who used to say things like, when you take a course, you are mostly taking the professor. Or what my old prof Ralph Lynn used to say about needing to remember that when you're on fire, when you're on fire with belief, somewhere there are others with equal passion and certainly about the precise opposite of what you think is true, what you are sure is true. Or my old teacher of modern English novels, Mark Rowan, who used to talk about what he called Rowan's Law, justice for you, mercy for me. Rowan had these pithy sayings about the omnipresence of the double standard everywhere and the essential self-centeredness of human beings. My best example, though, is my old professor of early modern English literature, Walter Staten. Walter knew so much about early modern English literature that I wouldn't have been surprised if he had memorized every line of Ben Jonson and John Donne, not to mention Thomas Traherne. Yet it was Walter who most memorably explained to me one day, in his living room, the wisdom of Shakespeare's Falstaff. And Walter did so by telling me a story of playing on the floor with his young son one evening while an overly serious graduate student was trying in vain to get Walter's attention so that they could discuss the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. It's a story I've never forgotten and one that I always tell my Shakespeare classes when I teach the history plays that feature Falstaff. And the moral is that those who take life too seriously are missing something of vital importance, the great fun of silly impulse, so central to the sheer joy of being alive. So, given the relationship between knowledge and wisdom, given the parental influence of professors, and given the strong memories I have of classroom wisdom, I sometimes wonder how could we not be teaching wisdom in the classroom? Or are we doing it without quite knowing it? Should we keep doing it, but not say anything public about it, lest we make promises that we can't keep? Is the communication of wisdom the dangerous little secret at Beloit College? Something that dares not speak its name because we fear that the only true path to wisdom is through long post-graduation experience. I myself have learned in an ironic and astonishing way that as a classroom teacher, I have been in the wisdom business for a long time. Starting about 20 years ago at reunions and homecomings, ex-students would approach me and remind me of something I said in their class that has always stuck with them and been useful to them ostensibly in their lives. I was astounded because I could not remember saying any of those things, but they did. I never thought of myself as an especially wise person, a judgment that my wise wife and children and friends, many of whom are gathered here today, would most certainly confirm. And yet I presumably said those wise things that students remembered long after they had forgotten my reading of Hamlet that gave them comfort or insight later in their lives. I'm sure you remember, said one, that time we were studying Keats and Yeats, and you said that their poems were dealing with the fundamental human problems of the ego, and that it stems from the world not doing what we want it to do and not making us feel what we want it to feel, and how Keats and Yeats were trying to solve this problem by, by fleeing to a small part of the world that would satisfy their egos even if they had to give up most of the world in order to get there. Well, as I've had my own ego problems, that's always stuck with me and given me some wisdom about myself. So, hey, thank you, Tom. 
Well, I couldn't remember ever saying anything about Keats and Yeats looking at Grecian urns and fleeing to Byzantium in order to solve their ego problems. This was probably a throwaway line or maybe a moment of inspired digression while I was getting back to Keats's rhyme scheme or Yeats's failed love affairs or while indeed I was trying to remember what I was going to say next while I, in other words, was getting back to knowledge. But that's not what stayed with this student. Instead, she remembered something about fundamental ego problems. Or a former student would say, I recall once you said that one of life's greatest frustrations was that when we wanted free will, we got determinism, and when we wanted determinism, we got the dreadful challenge of having to decide for ourselves. And I think we were studying King Lear back then, Tom, and well, that's really stayed with me as I've tried to make my own life more satisfying. Anyhow, thanks for saying that. And again, I had no memory of ever having said any such thing. Now, having been complimented by these graduates, who can recall nothing of what I said about the structure of King Lear, but only my throwaway asides, which I likely uttered in order to gather my thoughts about ostensibly more important things, such as the likely composition date of King Lear, I have immediately gone home from reunions, generally followed by a hangover, and written down my forgotten wisdom. And now I plant such wisdom more deliberately into classroom contents. In fact, as I've gotten older, I fear I've become a sententious old fart, like Polonius in Hamlet, dispensing questionable wisdom. One of my great heroes, former Chicago Bears coach Mike Ditka used to say, in both football and in life, and I find myself saying, over and over again, but not much longer, in both literature and life. Oh, I still, still teach literary history, and I teach rhetorical history, and the difference between synecdoche and metonymy, whatever that is. But I find myself more and more becoming an old-fashioned mimetic critic who talks about what Shakespeare teaches us about life. I find myself starting to agree more and more with something that I never agreed with before, something that Samuel Johnson said more than 200 years ago when he wrote that a hermit in a cave could learn a lot about life from just reading Shakespeare, even if he interacted with others hardly at all. So that's my story of the wisdom I've gotten and the wisdom I've received, not from internships, though they are valuable, but from sitting in a classroom. I don't think I'm by myself here. Others have shared similar stories, both from sitting in front of the lectern and from standing and talking behind it. None of this means I myself am wise. I've let you in a little secret. I've stood at my own life plenty of times. Still, I'm glad that while I've not always been able to walk the walk, others later in life have found that my talking the talk, somehow help them walk the walk, or at least crawl the crawl a little better. And I do note that any classroom wisdom may not have meant much until former students had to face the crises of their own lives. So my uncle Gaston's concept of the school of hard knocks still has an important place at the wisdom table. I might, by the way, pause just briefly to say that I feel somewhat guilty calling Uncle Gaston Uncle Gaston because he hated to be called Uncle Gaston. His last name was Mickey, M-U-E-C-H-E, which, which was German, and he insisted that we always call him Uncle Mickey because he hated his first name, Gaston. Uh, one of the things that I was told when I was nine years old is never call Uncle Mickey anything but Uncle Mickey. So. Wherever you are today, Uncle Mickey. I'm sorry I called you Uncle Gaston. And yet, getting back to the script, I have termed this talk the lost art of classroom wisdom. This is a pessimistic title. I will close trying to explain it. No, it isn't that this art is lost because I'm leaving. If anyone were to say that I'm important, they would be like those who prematurely reported the death of Mark Twain greatly exaggerated. No, I think wisdom, if it ever spent a long time in the classrooms of yesteryear, will not darken its door again anytime soon. Why? 
Well, for one thing, there is the sheer volume of information. In an earlier time, the body of knowledge in a discipline was more or less settled for a while. This gave professors more time to think about the wise meaning of the knowledge they professed, perhaps, because they were more secure in the assumption that their knowledge was relatively stable. And then there is the fact that wisdom often comes in the statement of sententious principles, as in the overworked, those who do not learn from the past are condemned to repeat it. Or as my old eighth grade history teacher, Marion Martin used to say, those who are unable to remember eighth grade history are condemned to repeat it next year. We live, however, in a contemporary world of factoids and information on a planet of truths that go around the world on the internet and come out distorted and out of context. We live, in other words, in a fragmentary world, not a wise one. And finally, the new wisdom about the classroom is not that it should teach students about how to navigate the world in wisdom and judgment, but that it should teach students how to change the world with innovative high technology and savvy new methods of persuasion and political consciousness raising. This is the new consensus I submit, and I don't expect it to change anytime soon. On the other hand, as Eleanor Roosevelt once said to the South African when he said at the UN that apartheid would never end, never, she said, is a long, long time. And so I leave you with the distinct possibility that the art of classroom wisdom, now ostensibly lost, will someday be found. Meanwhile, I urge Beloit College to find it again even sooner. But then many of my colleagues might say, we have never lost it. And that reminds me, what do I know anyhow? Perhaps it is wise for me to just shut up. But thank you for listening anyhow. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now we have uh, time for about uh, 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 seven or eight minutes of uh, questions of Q&A, if anybody would like to ask anything. Uh, Professor Elder uh, is going to wait for the microphone. Uh, thank you. Um, in my profession, the dismal science, uh, uh, we have concepts called flows and stocks, and flows add to stocks. Uh, saving is a flow that adds to the stock of wealth. Uh, and it's an organizational tool that might be applied here. Um, in particular, learning might be a flow which adds to our stock of knowledge. Ah. Mm -hmm. Uh, experience may be a flow that adds to our stock of wisdom. Ah. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I wonder, with regard to this innovation here at Beloit College, the Liberal Arts in Practice Initiative, uh, I wonder whether those who have brought this to us are saying that you're right, uh, that there is uh, a lost art of classroom wisdom that is to gain the experience which flows into our uh, 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 stock of, of wisdom, we've got to go outside the classroom mm -hmm. and put the liberal arts into practice and internships and overseas experiences. Right, I think that's a very interesting comment and I, I could see sort of two models of analogy. You know, one model is I guess the optimistic one uh, because we certainly know that, uh, you know, the more we say, the, you know, the more we uh, put into stocks over the long haul, I'm, praying this is true as I contemplate my PIA craft, uh, <clears throat> you know, certainly that adds up. And uh, so that there is, in fact, a great, you know, store of, of resources. And certainly, I think, you know, we go from wisdom to wisdom. I think it is possible for experience to create wisdom, which creates wiser experiences, which creates more wisdom. And then by the time, you know, you are coming to, let's say, my age, you are a person who is rich in both experience uh, and uh, wisdom. On the other hand, we know that you know, in the short term, uh, there are lots and lots of mistakes that are made. And I guess that this is the reason why in the stock market you're supposed to diversify, right? Because you don't want any single mistake to become uh, too dangerous. And yet we know in life, certain mistakes can be so dangerous as to 
uh, you know, be so, be so crucial that you actually uh, never get over them. So on the one hand, yes, there's this model of experience accrues and you just get richer and richer in wisdom and experience. But on the other hand, of course, there's the, the gamble, uh, which of course you economists are very aware of, uh, perhaps best summarized by Henry Ford, who said, half of my advertising budget is wasted if only I knew which half. And this, of course, is the, the, the part of wisdom that you, you know, there's some wisdom that you can just never quite gain, perhaps. Right, but I think that's an interesting analogy. Now, anybody else? Right over here. And I believe this is uh, Professor John Cotton. Yes, it is, it is. It is. I wonder on Shakespeare's birthday today, if you could give an example of the wisdom of Shakespeare that has affected your life in, in a specific way, or, or uh, part of that wisdom you were talking about, just giving it a context. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, it is uh, true that uh, today is, I believe, the 450th uh, birthday of the Bard, and I might also add that Professor Kaufman is bringing out the Bard, uh, I believe, later this week, starting tomorrow, is that right? Uh, with uh, his production of, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. And uh, so, uh, yes, I, I mean, I think that, you know, to me, as I come back to the Bard, you know, the, the wisdom that, that, you know, is really most salient to me is this, this sort of generic uh, wisdom that I find uh, in the Bard uh, between the comedies and the uh, tragedies. Uh, the wisdom, of course, of the comedies being that, uh, indeed, there is a, a kind of flexibility, adaptability, balance that can lead to laughter and happy endings. Uh, you know, where you take the seeds in the orange juice of life and you drink around them and you end up with a fine midsummer night's dream. But on the other hand, with the tragedies, of course, when you tend to want to evaluate your principles against the cosmos, regardless of how risky that is, it can lead to tragedy. And while on the one hand, you might say that, you know, well, everybody would use comedy as opposed to tragedy. There is something, and I think Shakespeare gets at this, kind of empty about uh, comedy. It's a little like Groucho Marx, right? I have my principles. If you don't like them, I have others. It's very funny, but it's a little bit empty, whereas Lear is, you know, very, very, very principled. But, of course, he's also destroyed. So this, I think, is the real sort of trade-off in life, and I, I got this. I get this more from Shakespeare than from anyone else, definitely. Anyone else? Professor uh, uh, Charles Westerberg. Uh, yeah, Tom, I, I, I was intrigued by the uh, uh, ability you had for recalling your professors who uh, said wise things. And uh, I'm wondering, I, that, that got me to uh, wondering about the unwise teachers and professors you, you might have had. Uh, and so I'm wondering if, if uh, some professors are wiser than others mm. and uh, what might make them so. Uh, well, that's a, a, a really good question. I mean, <coughs> I remember a speech professor I had named uh, Mary Burris, uh, who uh, I don't remember Mary Burris ever saying anything uh, wise in the classroom. And uh, yet her class uh, is one of the very few where I could actually remember uh, you know, certain details. She taught me a lot about how to, how to make a speech. And, and maybe the reason I remember that is because you know, I kind of went into making speeches three times a week or whatever for a living five days a week for a living. Uh, but uh, I don't remember anything, you know, particularly uh, why she said. But I, but I think that, uh, indeed, that's because she was a nuts and bolts professor. The, the wise professors I remember were the ones who were really very, very, very passionate about their subject and had this almost kind of palpable guilt about how can I teach it if, in fact, it isn't, you know, sort of good for something. It doesn't really help somebody, you know, other than just getting a job or just getting, uh, you know, a, a union, a, an academic uh, union card. Uh, but I can certainly remember a lot of us, I think we all can, who were neither particularly knowledgeable, were not particularly good at communicating knowledge, nor were, uh, you know, particularly uh, wise. And I, I guess those professors would probably be those that you would kind of have to remind me that I even, that I even had. Uh, but, uh, but, but to me, you know, the, the really wise professors uh, were the ones who, you know, kind of, kind of worried about, you know, what's Ben Johnson really good for, anyhow, okay? And Walter, Walter Staten, who was probably the most learned professor 
uh, I ever had was at once, I think, the one who was, you know, sort of the most in tune with the, really the human side. I mean, I remember he uh, taught us Ben Johnson's little poem about the death of his son, and he, he, he talked to us about how moving this poem was to him, and he talked to us about the process of grieving, and so he was amazingly learned, but also an amazingly wise uh, man. Yes, Jerry Gustafson, Emeritus Professor. Try to, to try to teach wisdom uh, is uh, to try to teach good character. Yeah. And trying to teach good character uh, implies trying to change uh, the student into our image of what is good character. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't that kind of uh, illiberal or maybe even immoral? Uh, it, it certainly could be. Uh, one of the things that at least I try to do in my classes is to always try to present you know, multiple sides. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> this is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit nervous about a wisdom agenda you know, in the classroom, okay? Uh, because I think a wisdom in agenda in the classroom can end up you know, a little bit with the Stockholm Syndrome. So I, th I take your, I take your uh, objection uh, to that. And certainly, uh, you know, if you go back to what I have now become somewhat intrigued about, which is uh, Keats and Yeats and the, and the ego problem, uh, I mean, when I raise this question now, and I do raise it a little bit more explicitly now, one of the things I point out is that you can't turn to Salem, to Byzantium, or Ode on the Grecian Urn as any kind of cult solution to the problem of the ego, because those people, in trying to solve their ego problems, gave up an enormous uh, amount of the world. In fact, in Ode on the Grecian Urn, uh, Keats almost undercuts, in some ways, his own argument. And then, after uh, sailing to Byzantium, uh, Yeats wrote a companion poem called Byzantium, saying, oh, well, you can't actually get out of the natural world quite as easily as I thought. So I think it's important to get students into a realm of wisdom, but then make it very, very clear that a realm of wisdom should be approached intellectually and you know, not as though it were uh, uh, you know, becoming clear in Scientology or something like that. Right. And we actually have a question from Twitter, and it is, what does the future hold for education and the liberal arts? How will the future curriculum be different? How would what? How will the future curriculum be different? How would a wisdom curriculum be different? Future curriculum. Oh, how would a future curriculum be different in a liberal arts college? This is a, a tweet? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure that I uh, really have any uh, profound uh, wisdom about uh, that, that matter, but <clears throat> I do think that uh, you know, liberal arts colleges uh, are, on the one hand, uh, you know, supposed to be, to some degree, in, in the, right in the business of of, of general education, we're supposed to be in the business of teaching, you know, sort of, you know, major principles of learning. I think the social sciences have those, the natural sciences have those, right? The natural sciences have the scientific method, the social sciences have this thing about statistics, and, and uh, since Larry White is here, you know, the well-designed study, and the humanities, of course, have this whole business of of hermeneutics. So I think, you know, on the one hand, we're sort of dealing with these kinds of very, very broad principles. But on the other hand, we are now, of course, chock-a-block with specific data. And so I think in the future, liberal arts colleges are going to have to figure out how to balance those two things. The other thing, of course, that's definitely coming uh, are what are called MOOCs, right, the massive online uh, courses. Uh, and, of course, at Beloit, we really emphasize the personal uh, touch, but uh, the personal touch, I think, in the, in the longer run, I mean, MOOCs are going to be seen as so much uh, cheaper. And so, you know, can Beloit continue with uh, this education that is highly, highly intensive, personal, uh, et cetera, without pricing itself out of existence? So I think that's going to be a big economic issue for us. Right, so information age and economics, those are the two big issues. I see, which I will probably not live to see the outcome of. So. Is there anything else? Are we, are we done here, Caroline? Are we done here? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>